Before we start, a big thank you to today's sponsor, Wicked Clothes. Wicked are one of my all-time favourite clothing stores, and they've been a massive help to the channel, sponsoring me for well over a year now. I wear Wicked almost every day, and I know many of you who enjoy my channel will love their store. They have some true crime themed items, and they're always releasing new and interesting designs. Here are some of my own personal favourites. Wicked also have a sale on, so go and check them out and grab yourself some baggins. To support the channel and to get some cool clothing, click the link in the description or pinned in the comments, and use the coupon code DISTURBIN for 10% off your basket. And now, onto the video. This case takes place in Silver Spring, Maryland, on a very hot afternoon, on the 31st of May, 1986. Everyone was out enjoying the summer heat. Everyone except Haddon Clark, who at the time was 35 years of age, skinny, and 6 foot 2 inches tall. He had an awkward posture and instantly stood out in a crowd. On this day, he was by himself, outside his brother Jeffrey's empty home, sweating and leaning against his beloved Daston pickup truck. Haddon was feeling sorry for himself and getting angry. The hotter it got, the angrier he seemed to become. The house was silent, as everyone else was out enjoying the sun. Haddon had been living with his only brother that wasn't in prison, Jeffrey Clark, and Jeffrey's family. But he had been asked to get his belongings and to go. They wanted him gone by the time they returned home. A few months earlier, Haddon had been arrested for stealing women's underwear from a shop, and had stolen them to wear for himself. Stealing was bad enough, but the final straw was much more recent and much more disturbing. A few days earlier, Haddon had relieved himself in front of his young nieces and nephews. His brother Jeffrey had no choice other than to cut him loose. Just a year earlier, Haddon was discharged from the Navy. Doctors had diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic, and he had not been taking the medication he was prescribed. Just a week before Haddon was told to leave the house, he had been enraged by his six-year-old niece. She had called him a slur, and he was so angry that he wanted to kill her. Revenge is very much a theme that runs throughout Haddon's life. He wants to get even with those he feels have scorned him. Haddon was still outside his brother's house, staring at the front door and raging inside. He had to go and get the last of his belongings, and as he was walking to the door, a little girl walked up to him and asked him where his niece was. Haddon instantly recognises the little girl as Michelle Daw, a six-year-old who lives a few doors down the road, but most importantly, his niece's best friend. He saw this as an opportunity to get revenge on his niece. When Michelle asked this question, Haddon replied by saying, She's upstairs in the house playing with her dolls. You can go in and see her if you like. Haddon lets Michelle into the house, and she slowly makes her way upstairs. Haddon then went back to his pickup truck to grab his toolbox. Being a chef, his toolbox was full of a variety of knives, serrated blades, meat cleavers, and more. Each blade had been honed to its maximum sharpness. Haddon had selected a 12-inch blade, and once Michelle had made her way upstairs, he followed her into his brother's house. Haddon tiptoed into his niece's bedroom, where Michelle Daw was looking for her friend. He picked her up and threw her to the floor. Michelle was frozen, too scared to even scream. Haddon slashed her twice across the chest, making an X shape, and put his hand over her mouth so she wouldn't be able to scream. Michelle then bit his hand, and this enraged him. In retaliation, Haddon stabbed her in the throat with all of the 12-inch blade. With the blood aggressively spurting from her wound, Haddon was not sure what to do first. Clean up the blood, or try to have his way with the remains of Michelle. He chose the latter, but was unable to do it. Suddenly realising what he had done, he started to panic. Haddon went to his pickup truck and grabbed his duffel bag, rags and bin bags. He went back to Michelle's body and placed her inside the duffel bag. He put all items with blood on them in the bin bags and proceeded to scrub the floor with the rags. 
Once he was done cleaning up, to the naked eye, you could not tell the horrors of which had happened in that room. Haddon then needed to get to work. He was working as a chef and had 20 minutes to get there before he was late. So he just threw the body of Michelle and the blood-soaked items into his pickup truck and left for work. At around 5.30pm, Jeffrey Clark and his family returned to the house. There was no suspicions raised and they began to enjoy the last of the sun by having a barbecue in the garden. Carl Dorr, Michelle's father, came round and asked Jeffrey if he had seen his daughter. Carl had not seen Michelle since she was playing in the paddling pool in the garden of their home just a few hours earlier. Carl believed that his daughter was safe there, and while she was playing in the sun, he went inside to watch TV. Michelle then soon became bored on her own and wanted to see if any of her friends were out playing. She managed to leave the garden undetected. And that's when she ran into Haddon. After searching everywhere with no luck, Carl phoned the police and told them his daughter was missing. Carl quickly became the prime suspect in his daughter's disappearance. At around midnight after his shift, Haddon drove towards Baltimore on Old Columbia Pike. He stopped at a secluded wooded area, grabbed the duffel bag containing Michelle's remains, along with a flashlight and a shovel, and proceeded to walk into the woods. He then dug a four-foot grave at the base of a tree. He took Michelle out of the bag, but before he placed her in the grave, he cut off some of her flesh and consumed it. He then made his way back to his newly rented flat, not too far from where his brother lived. The next day, the police were searching the area and speaking to locals about the disappearance of Michelle. Detective Wayne Farrell came across Haddon Clark outside his brother's house. He was fixing the engine of his new pickup truck. The detective questioned Haddon if he was here yesterday, to which he replied, yes, for about three or four minutes. The detective then asked the locals about Haddon and found out that he was known as the local creep and relayed this information onto his colleague, Mark Garvey, who then instructed Haddon to come into the police station for questioning in the morning. The next morning, during the questioning, Haddon appeared to have an airtight alibi. He said that his work clock had timestamped him in at around 2.40pm. Unfortunately, the police had also questioned Carl Daw, who was ashamed that he had left his daughter unsupervised for so long and lied about the last time he had seen her. He told the police that he had last seen Michelle playing in the pool at 10 past 2 p.m., when in reality, he had last seen her at around midday. This gave Haddon the perfect alibi, as the police did not think it was possible to abduct, kill, hide a body, and to make it to work in 30 minutes. The police still tested Haddon in questioning, though, they put a photograph of Michelle on the table and asked him what did he do to her. Haddon started to rock back and forth in his chair and tears streamed down his face. Haddon said he needed to be sick and went to the bathroom. Whilst he was vomiting, the police still pressed him. What did you do to her? They asked. Haddon replied by saying, I don't know, sometimes I just black out. After being close to giving a confession and being charged, Haddon regained composure and reiterated that he had a timestamp at work for 2.40pm and that he did not see Michelle. Carl Dorr had given his daughter's murderer an airtight alibi, and it would be another 14 years before her death would be solved by the authorities. Haddon was born in April of 1951 and was born into a privileged but abusive family. His grandfather served as mayor of White Plains, New York, and his father had an MBA and a PhD in chemistry, and helped to invent cling film and fire retardant carpet. This gave Haddon an affluent upbringing, but abuse was never far away. Both of his parents were alcoholics. Haddon was the second child born, but his mother always wanted a girl. She would dress him in girl's clothing and call him Kristen when she was drunk. Haddon's father would also beat him and call him all manner of names whilst growing up. In 1984, Haddon's older brother Bradfield was on a date with a woman called Patricia Mack. 
After a night of drinking alcohol and taking drugs, Bradfield smashed Patricia's head off a brick wall and strangled her. He cut her body into 11 pieces in a bathtub, cooked her breasts on a barbecue, and consumed them. Guilt later got to him, and he confessed to the police. He is currently serving time in prison. Haddon's youngest brother Jeff was charged with physically assaulting his wife twice and convicted once. He was known to be a physically abusive person. And finally, his youngest sibling, his sister Allison, would break all ties with her family and said to investigators, I never had a family. After the murder of Michelle Daw, Haddon's mental state would deteriorate over the next five years. He would flip between renting and living in his pickup truck. One of his ex-landlords who had evicted him in this period felt the force of Haddon's instability. Haddon's former landlord stated that he had a competitive spirit and that his lifestyle was getting even. When he left the property for good, Haddon booby-trapped the house by putting a 10-gallon oil can above the front door so it would spill over when the door was opened. He spray-painted the carpets black, hid fish heads in the chimney, piano and stove which stank out the entire house, and even killed the landlord's two cats and pinned them to his front door. After this, he began to steal from his mother. When she found out and confronted him, he hit her and pushed her to the ground. He then proceeded by trying to run her over in his pickup truck. His mother narrowly escaped with her life, and after this incident, she disowned him. With his father dying of cancer a couple of years earlier, Haddon was now truly alone. In February of 1989, the local police arrested Haddon, this time for 15 counts of theft. Haddon had been dressing as a woman and going to church choir groups. Whilst there, he would go into the cloakroom and rob the handbags and coats. When police searched his truck, they found various purses and coats, to which the police asked if all of these were his. Haddon replied yes and stated that he was a woman. The police later found wigs, hypodermic syringes, women's dresses, and lots of cash. He was convicted and sentenced to just 45 days in prison. Haddon boasted that he did the jail time because it was easier than being on the streets during the winter. He enjoyed the warmth and the three meals a day. Haddon was given such a light sentence as his public defender had gone the extra mile and convinced the court that Haddon was seeking help for his mental health. Although, this wasn't true. His defender, Donald Salzman, took that much pity on him that he wrote this note to pass on to any law enforcement who arrested him. The note is now on screen. Haddon was extremely dangerous, but the courts and public defenders were doing all they could to keep him on the streets. What happens next is because he was not stopped at this point. Haddon's days working as a chef were long gone. He started doing the odd cash-in-hand jobs and was also doing gardening work through a homeless shelter. It was through this gardening work that he got a job at Penny Houtling's house. Penny lived in a place called Bethesda in Maryland, just 10 miles away from where he murdered Michelle Daw. Penny thought that she was helping the less fortunate and was simply hiring a homeless man who could help her with her gardening. Penny was very trusting and perhaps naive. When her jewellery and underwear started going missing, she didn't suspect Haddon. The two formed quite the bond, and Haddon felt like he had a new mother. Literally. Unfortunately, Haddon's bubble was about to burst when Penny's daughter returned home from her studies at Harvard University. Penny's daughter Laura had the world at her feet. She was charismatic, intelligent, and beautiful. And once she was home, Penny didn't have as much time for Haddon as she did before. Haddon was enraged and needed to seek revenge. Haddon had his opportunity when Penny announced that she would be going away for a few days in October. Eager to get his revenge, Haddon visited a hardware store and bought some duct tape, rope, and nylon cord. Eerily, he paid by check, and in the memo section of the check he wrote, Laura. On the night of the murder, Laura was sleeping alone in the house. Haddon quietly pulled up outside the house in his pickup truck. He got out of the truck wearing a woman's wig, Penny's underwear, a black blouse, slacks, and a woman's trench coat. 
and under the trench coat he was concealing a rifle. He went to the garden shed where he knew there was a spare key to the house and silently let himself in. He crept into Laura's bedroom where she was sleeping. He nudged her awake with his rifle. Laura woke up staring down the barrel of a gun to which behind was Haddon dressed as a woman. Laura froze. Haddon said, Why are you in my bed? Why are you wearing my clothes? Tears began streaming down Laura's face. Haddon then said, Tell me I'm Laura. Laura replied and told Haddon that he was Laura and begged him not to hurt her. Following this, Haddon made Laura undress and take a bath at gunpoint. This is what he called the cleansing process. He led her back to the bedroom and made her swear on the Bible that he was in fact Laura. His plan was to take her to the woods and introduce her to Haddon. He bound her arms and legs with duct tape, but he got overzealous and covered her mouth and eyes with the duct tape so much that she could no longer breathe. Laura slowly suffocated and lay motionless. Once she had seemingly died, Haddon began to remove the duct tape from her face with some scissors. But he slipped and pierced her neck with the blade. As blood began to exit the wound, he noticed some earrings. He liked them, so he took one off with ease, but the other one he struggled with. So he just took the scissors and amputated the lower part of her ear to get the earring. After this, Haddon lay with the body for an hour before wrapping the body in the bedsheet and placing it in his truck. He claimed not to have eaten or essayed any part of Laura's body. The alarm was quickly raised the next day as Laura was very well connected in the community. It was not long before the police were involved and this made Haddon very nervous. He buried Laura just off the motorway in a shallow grave. He had to rush the job as he was expecting the police to come and question him at any moment. He placed all the blooded items in a self-storage locker paid for by the year. Apart from the pillowcase, he kept this so he could relive the murder by rubbing his face into it. By this point, Penny had mentioned Haddon's name to the police. And this filtered through to Detective Robert Phillips who remembered Detective Mike Garvey's account of Haddon throwing up and almost admitting to the murder of Michelle Dahl. Detective Garvey was adamant that Haddon was their main suspect. Haddon was brought in for questioning, and at the same time there was a canine search of the whole area of Penny's premises. The dogs led police into the woods near Penny's house and a church. They were taken to one of Haddon's campsites, where they recovered some of Penny's clothing but most importantly, a blooded pillowcase. And on this blooded pillowcase was a fingerprint. During the questioning of Haddon, police pushed their luck and told him that they had found his fingerprints on the pillowcase and asked him what he did to Laura. Haddon started crying and stated that he didn't remember. Despite having the fingerprints, they were not sure whose it was yet. And because Haddon did not confess, they had to let him go. Over the next few days, the police found the check Haddon had used to buy the murder kit, with the name Laura written on it. And by this point, the fingerprint had come back positively as Haddon's. It was now time to arrest him. The police found Haddon sleeping in the back of his truck, hugging a teddy bear. He would never see freedom again. He was later sentenced to 30 years for the murder of Laura. Once in prison, he met a fellow inmate who bore a striking resemblance to a popular image of Jesus Christ. Believing that his inmate was actually Jesus, Haddon confessed to him about the murder of Michelle Daw and where he buried her. Thinking he could get parole, the inmate told officers what Haddon had said to him. And in January of 2000, Haddon led the police to the burial site of Michelle, almost 14 years after he had killed her. Haddon had also confessed to the inmate to a further 12 murders. He claimed to have buried them along the eastern seaboard between the mid-70s and 1993. He took the police to various locations, but no other bodies were ever found. However, there is some credence to his claims. On one of these trips, he did take the police to a buried big box of jewellery that he claimed to be the trophies of his victims. 
Some of the items belonged to Laura. Haddon also confessed that he would drink the blood of his female victims. When the police asked him why, he replied, I thought if I drunk the blood of women, it would transform me into a woman. I wanted to become the women and girls that I killed. Haddon later received another 30-year sentence for the murder of Michelle Daw. I shall now pass you over to Mike from Bizar Bazaar, who will give us some further insight into Haddon. Be sure to check out his channel too. Hello everyone, and thanks for having me back, D. I wanted to show you some of my correspondence with Haddon. I have been writing to him on and off for some time, so there is too much to show you everything here, but I'm just going to pull a few bits from various letters. This is the first letter he wrote me, and I felt he shown how socially inept he was straight away. When I hear about Haddon, it's always mentioned how odd he is, and this is how he decided to break the ice with me. Dear Mike, here are all the rules in Maryland. 1. You cannot send me stamps or stamped envelopes. 2. You cannot send me greetings cards. 3. You cannot send me pens, pencils, paper, etc. 4. You cannot send me artwork. 5. You cannot send me photos, naked women. 6. You cannot put address stickers or any other type of sticker or lipstick stains or any other type of stain on the inside or outside of the envelope. Hi Haddon. Thanks for that mate. He always mentions this in every piece of correspondence as well. I now collect autographs of athletes, actors and actresses. Autograph sports cards. 8x10 colour photos or 5x7s. Can you send me any from Great Britain? Actress Jane Seymour. Beatles or any other actors or actresses. How about the Manchester football team? Soccer. Can you get me any of their autographs? I'm not joking, he hammers this in every single letter. Can you send me anything? Can any of your friends send me anything? Do you know anyone who can send me anything? It's clearly part of his mental disorder to be obsessive about things in such a way. There was one thing about the case I was really curious about and I couldn't find any answers online. It was about his cellmate, Jesus. Did he really confess to him? Why and who was he? Jesus' real name is John Tratt. I think this says John Tratt. Can anyone read that? Let me know in the comments. John told me to call him Jesus. So he and his wife Jackie would help me get into a mental hospital in Maryland. John had no intention of ever helping me. John is no longer in prison. I help him get out of prison. If I ever get out of prison, I stay away from John. I don't want anything to do with this asshole. Like the Bible says in Matthew 7.15, he's a wolf in sheepskin. John has a lot of medical problems anyway. I think this is a great insight. John is now free and Haddon is still in prison. Did Haddon just get played? I'm taking him by his word because the only thing I can find online about Jesus, aka John, is that he went on these searches with Haddon and the FBI looking for more bodies. Was Haddon really just trying to play the system? Another thing I asked Haddon was about these searches with the FBI. It's reported that whilst he was doing them, he was dressed as a woman. And so I asked him if this was true. And if so, why? I've been wearing female clothes most of all my life. Since seven, was raised like a girl. I've also done a lot of crazy stuff in female clothes. Why did I wear female clothes with the police and FBI? to manipulate them and make them think I have a split personality. If he just said it's because it's what he feels comfortable wearing, then that would have been a perfectly fine answer. But the second part shows that he's got an ulterior motive. It seems that trying to fool law enforcement just backfired on him and only served to convince people that he is a very dangerous individual. Lots of my correspondence with Haddon talks about abuse. No doubt he was abused but he talks as if everyone he ever met abused him, and I find this hard to believe, because surely there would be a whistleblower. I told my parents I wanted to be a sailor for Halloween. My stepmother told me she knew someone who had this navy uniform for me. When I get to this lady's house, she had a female navy officer white shirt for me. 
she turned me into her. I don't know how she did it, but she had my photo on her military ID, driver's license, passport, nurse's ID, plus I have social security number, birth certificate, checking and savings account, and keys to her car and house. All in this purse, she would tell me is mine. My step-parents weren't the only ones behind this practical joke. He goes on to tell me more about who else abused him. I'd be at the dentist getting my teeth done, when the dentist told me he had an apprentice job for 20 hours a week, where he would pay me, but I had to wear a white female uniform dress to work. This dentist told me he supplied me the uniform and the underwear. I take this apprentice job, but I was told under hypnosis. This dentist had me even wearing his wife's clothes. I have kinky sex with both this dentist and his wife. I was doing some yard work for this one lady, and when I was done, she asked me to stay for dinner. I tell her I have no clean clothes. She had me take a shower and put on some of her underwear, skirt and blouse, etc. Under hypnosis, I was told to do whatever she said. She and her husband were having sex with me. Each snippet that he writes is always some sexual encounter with a woman. I believe he's telling us part of the story. In his reality, with all the paranoid delusions added. Each snippet is probably someone he's either killed or done something really deviant to. What is important to note is that he always portrays himself as the victim. He cannot be held accountable. I hope this gives you a better insight into the mind of Haddon Clark. As I sign off, please take a look at some of the artwork he has sent me. It's all based around sign language. Take care.